Welcome to Neuroscience's Connection. I'm Kim Edwards, and we have another hot paper, this time with Professor David Kleinfeld. And he is with the Department of Physics, but he's been working with a group of grad students in uh, the graduate program in neurosciences. Yes. Welcome to the show. Thank you. We're talking about neurons talking to each other, and you've found a novel way to watch them do that. Correct. Tell me a little bit about that. Neurons will talk to each other in one of two ways. Either they'll talk one-on-one -on -one through a specialization called uh, synapses, where um, what's called one cell can talk to the other cell, and there's absolutely no back talk, which is, uh, if you're a parent, is a great thing. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> and the other way is that uh, neurons actually will broadcast um, to their immediate environment. They may affect hundreds of other cells, um, vessel, vascular cells to change blood flow, other neurons. Usually that, that kind of communication is usually slower because the molecule has to diffuse out like a dye in, in jello as opposed to just uh, being very fast on this almost split second uh, communication that you expect for cell to cell. So there was no means to measure this uh, broadcast mode in the past and yet uh, questions that involved this means of communication were very much uh, tied to our research and our research hopes for the future. And so you have figured out an innovative way to watch this and what, what was that innovation? Sort of the modern approach to uh, making measurements of cells communicating uh, or talking to each other is to use nature's own receptors. These are molecules that will bind, uh, these are large uh, molecules that will bind some of the small signaling molecules that cells send out to each other. And uh, we, we took a particular class of receptors, it's quite a mouthful, they're called G-protein coupled receptors. And these are actually phylogenetically the oldest receptors. This is how sponges talk within themselves. And uh, we, we use these and put these into a, a new kind of cell, actually it was a cancer line cell, and had these uh, particular G-protein coupled receptors that these could bind molecules like acetylcholine, serotonin, you hear about all the time in the news because of depression, other molecules. They'll, they'll bind these molecules and then they'll go through an internal chemical cascade, which again we abscond from nature. And uh, this will lead to the cell sort of producing this ion called calcium. And when the calcium concentration goes up in the cell, we could use uh, a sensor, itself a construct from uh, a number of natural proteins just pulled together from all kinds of different species, but we've sort of forced the cell to what's called express this protein. That it, and at the end of the day, um, this calcium sensor will uh, fluoresce. That is, you shine light at one color on it, like you shine blue light, and it'll give off either green light or red light, depending whether a calcium ion is bound. And that's what you referred to earlier as the twinkle in the night kind of effect? Right. So if if you bind this, in our case, if you, if you bind a particular signaling molecule, or the one that we used at first was acetylcholine, the cell will actually produce red light. And if you uh, don't bind acetylcholine, it'll give off green light. So just by looking at the color of the light coming back, we could actually tell uh, what the state of signaling is within the animal, within this particular place in its brain. Okay. And the method had not been used before in this way, correct? Right. I mean, uh, both the design of these cells, which uh, we christened sniffers, I hate to tell you how much time was spent trying to cook up an acronym, uh, was novel. Uh, the idea of embedding cells as, as detectors has some precedent in um, the drug world, in the world of cell culture, but not in, in the world of whole animals. So okay. it's um, and in using this novel signaling pathway, where do you can you envision now where, what it might lead to, or is it too early to jump out and talk about that? We could conjecture. I mean, we certainly did that uh, writing to our granting agencies. Um, I mean, in, in this first manifestation or realization of the, of the probe, we used it to detect a certain molecule called acetylcholine. That's the molecule that's sort of responsible for wakefulness and attention. And we used it in a, in a drug testing application. And this, this is an area, actually, one of the postdocs involved, Kwok Nguyen hopes to push, sort of what he calls in vivo uh, pharmacology. My personal uh, push is going to be to use these to detect the signals that are responsible for changing the flow of blood throughout the brain, depending on uh, how much sensory input comes in, depending on what the activity of the neurons are. 
And this is an open issue, and it really is an issue in detecting these small molecules, for which there was just no way to do this before. So we're making like a next generation of these molecules, really as we speak. Um, and we hope to detect some of these small molecules that have funny names, somatostatin, vasointestinal peptide, that control uh, blood vessels. And um, other directions have to do with using them in um, models of addiction. Paul Schlesinger at the Salk Institute would like to use these to look at the regulation of dopamine. Uh, Palmer Taylor, dean of the School of Pharmacological Sciences, is using these to detect serotonin, uh, always in the news because of depression. So if, we're, um, if nature is kind to us, it'll, it'll have legs, as they say. We had spoken earlier with Dr. Mobley about neurons talking to blood vessels. Explain, explain that for folks who yeah. might not understand it. Your brain is laced with uh, vasculature, blood vessels, and there's, you actually don't have enough blood within your brain to support neural activity everywhere. In a sense, if some wild stimulus came in uh, and caused every neuron to become active, you couldn't supply it with oxygen and you couldn't cool it fast enough. So in a sense, it's a limited resource, and you have to divvy up this limited resource within the brain. And the way this works is uh, blood vessels will be sensitive to local oxygen concentrations. They'll be sensitive to the activity of neurons, and they'll have to change in their size and either dilate or constrict. And um, work done in the past, in, in part with our lab, part with a member of the neurosciences department, Anna DeVore, showed how when activity comes, in effect, Areas that are quiet will actually have blood vessels that constrict and give up their blood to areas that have heightened uh, electrical activity that need more blood. Now, how, does, how, do the, how do the blood vessels know? And they know this because um, different classes of brain cells will produce different signaling molecules. And the game is really to uh, look at the relative concentrations of all these different signaling molecules. And right now there's... Um, no real way to do this uh, in real time. You'd have to actually slurp out a piece of the brain, which is not a <laughs> very useful experiment. So we hope to make our, expand our, our sniffers uh, into detecting these, these different molecules and plant them and sort of push the brain into situations where there are sort of conflicts in, in utilization of blood and then see which molecules go up and which molecules go down. Okay, that sounds fascinating, and I, I love the terms that come with it. The twinkle in the night and using, getting nature to spy on itself. Right, the last one was sort of stolen from uh, UCSD's <laughs> famous Roger Chen. <laughs> sounds like it was uh, an interesting process, though, that you enjoyed going through it. Yeah, it was fun. It was about three years' work, postdoc, uh, MD, PhD student, and, um, you know, and a lot of hardware. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us, okay, and again... Thank you another hot paper. We'll be back with another one next month.